Hi there, this is S.J. Thomason with Truth Matters at christian-apologist.com. Today we're going to talk about some fulfilled prophecies in Isaiah, and we're going to talk about deutero the theory that came out of the 18th century from some people who had some views about the Bible which were incorrect. Like, for example, they believed that there could be no fulfilled prophecies. Therefore, all of the authorship in the Bible in certain parts had to be taken uh, place, had to have, have taken place after the prophesied events. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to listen to part of a conversation between Megan Lewis and Bart Ehrman about the book of Isaiah. It's called, What Did the Prophet Isaiah Say About Jesus? Well, he actually said a lot about Jesus, but we're going to first shape the context of this conversation by understanding exactly what is going on in the book of Isaiah. And so you've come to the right place. I hope you'll stay tuned. I hope if you like this kind of content, you'll remember to like and subscribe and do come again and definitely do want to share it with your friends. So some people have claimed that Isaiah was written after the prophesied events. This is the Deutero-Isaiah proposition. And to say what this is, it means Isaiah likely authored chapters 1 to 5, and he may or may not have authored chapters 1 to 39, but other later unnamed authors definitely wrote the later books either during the time of Cyrus, and again, that's books 40 to 66, or in the Medo-Persian kingdom. And so Cyrus was around in 530. And the Medo-Persian kingdom was in the 5th century. These later authors from an Isaiah school redacted, added, modified, and changed his books in the centuries after he lived. So the prophet Isaiah lived around the 8th century BC. He lived in Judah under Assyrian captivity. Uh, The Hebrews were being punished and they were in exile. And that had been predicted, of course, in the book of Deuteronomy, which we're going to get into that as well. But let's first look at this idea that... Isaiah was written during or after these prophetic events. And so where does this come from? Well, we have an early scholar from 1883, C.N. Patterson, in the book Isaiah and the New Criticism, who understood where any of these assumptions that certain books, like the book of Daniel, people claiming that it's written in the second century BC, merely because of the inclusion and references to Antiochus Epiphanes. So people feel that it must be written after Antiochus Epiphanes walked the earth because Daniel was so specific in focusing on that. Same thing with Isaiah. Isaiah was very specific when he named King Cyrus, the Persian king, who came and uh, he came and took over from Babylon. And so we have first again, the Assyrian kingdom. Again, that's in the eighth century BC and the seventh century BC. And then after that, we had the Babylonian kingdom and especially what happened in 586 with uh, destruction of the first temple. Then we have the Medo-Persian kingdom, which started around 539 BC. And then, of course, that went all the way up until the Greek kingdom, and that was under King Alexander the Great in the 3rd century BC. And then after that, we have the Roman Empire. Now, those kingdoms are all mentioned in the book of Daniel. That's another thing that people look to when they decide that Daniel must have been dated to the 2nd century, and they split out the Medes and the Persians and claim that the Greek kingdom was, was mentioned only because it was written during the Greek Empire. But I digress. Uh, In that particular reference, it does speak to the Roman Empire from which Jesus would arrive. Daniel also talked about the anointed one who would be cut off 77's last seven years, so 483 years after the call to rebuild Jerusalem went out. And so we know that there was uh, four calls to rebuild Jerusalem or the temple, and the last two of them is most likely because that was the call to rebuild Jerusalem. And those occurred between 457 and 444 BC. And so if we take 483 years after that, we get a window of time. And that's when the anointed one was going to be cut off. And of course, the anointed one was cut off when Jesus was crucified. uh, And then he resurrected. And that was in the year probably 33 AD. Okay, so just bringing us to that time, we saw some really cool prophecies. And we understand why these people are dating it as they are. So let's keep going. Here's what Ulrich Burgess says in 2010. He is talking again about Isaiah and this 150-year historical gap. Now, here's what he says. The historical gap of more than 150 years, which lies between Isaiah at the end of the 8th century and the time of the end of the exilic period, presumed in Isaiah 40 to 55, or Cyrus's decree in 539 BC, could, with the rise of the historical critical Bible interpretation, no longer be overcome by merely referring to the visionary power of Isaiah. 
To compound matters, Isaiah is said not only to have announced the prospect of salvation, but also to have mentioned the name of the new Persian ruler, Cyrus II, uh, who lived between 559 and 530 in Isaiah 44, 28 and 45, 1. It was this problem which gave rise towards the end of the 18th century to the argument between ecclesiastical and rationalistic interpretation. This argument was not only concerned with the question as to which words can be traced back to Isaiah, but more fundamentally with the question as to what rationally comprehensible accreditation one was prepared to give to the prophets and what not. This is of utmost importance to the emergence of the Deutero-Isaiah hypothesis. So you see that, that's in Burgess 2010, and it's in Old Testament Essays, volume 23, 3. Okay, so you can go ahead and find that. So the reasons to reject multiple authorship is the greater acronym, geographic reliability all through the book of Isaiah in trees, mountains, etrogs, uh, references to here and there, like referring to where exactly Isaiah is positioned, whether he's here in Judah or there over in Babylon. Also, uh, references to a person being around in the 8th century in Judah, not Babylon or Persia. Early attestations. So labeling Isaiah a prophet uh, had been done many, many times. Jeremiah called him a prophet in 2 Kings 28 to 11. Now I'm mentioning this because if a prophet has to prophesy something, <laughs> all right? So if he wouldn't be a prophet if he wrote after the events occurred. That's not prophetic. So Jeremiah said that the author of 2 Chronicles referred to him as a prophet in 32, 20 to 23. Jesus referred to Isaiah as a prophet in John 12, 36 to 43. Luke referred to him as a prophet in Acts 8, 26 to 38. Matthew 3, 3. Paul in Romans 10, 16. Uh, also Ben Sirach in Sirach 40, 20 to 22 mentioned him as a prophet. Josephus in Antiquities and Against Appian mentioned it. The Qumran in the Dead Sea Scrolls in 4Q176 and 4Q265, Damascus document MSA, CD 6, 7, and 8, and we have zero ancient corroboration of a long editorial process or multiple authors. It's always been attributed simply to the prophet Isaiah from the eighth century BC. We also have the book split out in an interesting way. So the first 39 chapters of Isaiah are kind of similar to the Old Testament with the idea of justice and punishment that's constantly happening. In fact, C.S. Lewis referred to this as the hammering process. So God had his chosen people and they were sort of given a hammering process to get to the point to make the way for Jesus, make the path straight for Jesus. And then the New Testament, those would be similar to the chapters of 40 to 66 and the ideas of comfort, righteousness, redemption, and hope. Interestingly, Isaiah refers to God as the Holy One of Israel all throughout the books and the chapters of Isaiah, I should say. So 26 times he refers to God as the Holy One of Israel, and there, it's mentioned 31 times in the entire Bible. So Isaiah really got into that, and so it seems to me highly unlikely that this is a separate author. Now let's look at some verses that predicted Jesus in Psalm 2, 6-12 said, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell you of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, S-O-N, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Okay, so we've got a reference. Today I have begotten you, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Okay, <laughs> through him all things are made for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven on the third day. Uh, or he was crucified on the third day. He rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. Okay, so what scriptures are is that? Well, the scriptures referred to what Jesus said was going to happen. It also referred to Jesus' reference to uh, Jesus' re reference to Jonah, who had died and gone into the belly of the whale for three days. So it's kind of like going into the earth for three days. It's a reference to that. It also was predicted again. He will see the light in Isaiah fifty-three. Those are the scriptures. 
Psalm 22. Jesus drew our attention to Psalm 22. Now, the Psalms are written around a thousand years before Christ by King David, these Psalms. Some of them were written by different authors who came from uh, David's line. But King David basically wrote Psalm 22, and it says in Psalm 22, 1, and in 16 to 18, the following. Now, first, let's note, Jesus drew our attention to this Psalm when he was on the cross in his final moments. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then a little later in the passage, he says, For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Okay, so that's pretty important because that exactly happened to Jesus on the cross. And of course, it's a reference to they have pierced my hands and feet. That's what happened on the cross. The other thing to note is the cross, uh, the crucifix the crucifixion, hadn't even been invented yet when this was written, when Psalms was written. It hadn't been invented till about the 5th century BC by the Persians, and it was perfected by the Romans after that. Jesus also drew our attention on the cross in his last moments when he said, into your hand I commit my spirit. That brings us to Psalm 31. Now let's take a look at a few passages in Psalm 31 that maybe Jesus wanted us to know. For you are my rock and my fortress, and for your namesake, you lead me and guide me. You take me out of the net. They have hidden for me. For you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. Because of all my adversaries, I have become a reproach, especially to my neighbors and an object of dread to my acquaintances. To those who see me in the street, flee from me. I have been forgotten like one who is dead. I have become like a broken vessel. For I hear the whispering of many, tear on every side, as they scheme together against me as they plot to take my life. So Isaiah refers to the servant. And before we listen to this, or before we, we uh, talk about this, let's take a look at what Bart Ehrman has to say about some of the topics that I've just covered. And so let's do that first. Make sure we got the audio here. Okay, so let's take a listen. And so just to make sure people understand this first Isaiah is written in like in say around the year 700 roughly uh, for the nation of Judah before Assyria wiped out the northern kingdom Israel uh, Assyria did not wipe out Judah as it turns out but 150 years later the Babylonians who took over the the, the area uh, became a world empire did destroy Jerusalem and second Isaiah is written after that and that has passages especially that Christians have always said were, uh, were talking about Jesus. I actually wanted to read a passage from Second Isaiah. It's uh, 53, 3 to 6, just so people can kind of get a feel for the language that we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> he was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hid their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, as someone who sat through numerous church services, this language is very Jesus adjacent. Yes. What is the writer actually talking about here? I'll tell you, it is impossible for a Christian to read that and not think Jesus. You, it cannot be done. <laughs> I mean, it just can't be done because it's so deeply ingrained in us that this is a prediction of the suffering Messiah. Um, and that this is talking about the one who's going to be executed for the sins of others. He's wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. I mean, uh, it boy, it's Jesus. And so I, I get that. I was raised that way too. And it's, uh, I understand that. As I said earlier, it's important to read, uh, his, historical scholars think it's important to read, uh, any book and any passage of any book in its own context to try and understand what it's talking about. So let's go ahead and do that. Now he's going to go on to predict or to say that the person is uh, is writing in the past. It's writing about a past uh, torture that basically happened. So the torture of Israel itself or a remnant of Israel. And that's a theory or an idea put forth by Rashi, or I should say popularized by Rashi around the 
the first, or I'm sorry, around the 10th century AD, Rashi said that that was uh, basically referring to Israel. But I'm going to show you when it says things like when he was pierced for our transgressions, how that wouldn't be fair. Uh, a God who's fair would not do that to the nation of Israel and the people of Israel, the remnant of Israel, to have them be pierced for our transgressions. In other words, pierce Israel for the transgressions of Assyria. It just doesn't make sense. That's not how a just Lord works. He doesn't pierce the country of Israel and all those people for that. So let's take a look right now. We'll go back to our verses and we'll talk about the, ser the servants passages because Bart does refer a little later in this video to the servant passages. So in Isaiah 52, 13 to 15, it says, behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Now notice this. He was marred, his appearance, beyond human semblance. So he is a human. It's clearly referring to a person, okay, who is marred beyond human semblance. And if you go to look at the Shroud of Turin, and where Jesus had been brutally whipped and all over his body, he'd been whipped uh, all over his head, even everywhere. And so it, looking at him at that point, he would have been full of blood. It would be blood and, and very, very, very violent and gory. And so that is what is prophesied here in this book. Now, again, Isaiah was written many years before Jesus walked the earth. So, whoops, I think I hit the, okay. So let's take a look now at the following passage that came right after that. Who has believed, this is Isaiah 53, I'll just read the whole thing instead of just the portion that Megan read. Who has believed that he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before his shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Jesus, of course, was without sin. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see the light and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide with the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressor. In other words, uh, it's, it's a redemptive thing. So God, basically Jesus died for us, for us, our men, for us, our sin and our salvation. Here's some other prophecies that Bart was referring to, prophecies of the servant. So Isaiah 42, 6 to 7, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. And of course, D Jesus did redeem people out of the grave. Isaiah 49, 6 says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Hosea 15 to 6 and 110. Hosea was a contemporary of Isaiah, as was Micah and Amos. So here's what Hosea said. I will return to my place 
until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face, and in their distress earnestly seek me. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, that he may heal us. He has struck us down, and he will bind us up. In the house of Israel, I have seen a horrible thing. Ephraim's whoredom is there. Israel is defiled. So Ephraim's part of the northern tribes. Israel's referring to the whole. And so we have the idea, basically, that Israel was not uh, without deceit. Okay, so Israel is defiled, in fact, at this time. And so we're going to say that this occurred before this time, and it's referring to the nation of Israel. Uh, Isaiah is referring to the nation of Israel. You have to remember, if Israel was punished, it was because of their sins, okay? They weren't punished um, because of somebody else's sins. It was because of their own sins. Micah, contemporary of Isaiah, in Micah 5, 2 to 4 says, But you, O Ephraim, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. Okay, so we got a little prediction that the Messiah is going to come into Bethlehem, which he of course did. Verses in Isaiah explain Jesus' rule over the nations in Isaiah 11:10, his reign in the kingdom in Isaiah 2, 3 to 5, righteous judgments, Isaiah 11, 3 to 5, 42, 1, 4, and 66. He is a light to the Gentiles who will worship him. That's mentioned in Isaiah 42, 6, 49, 6 to 7, and 52, 15. He would serve, would suffer in extreme ways, and would be rejected by his own people of Israel. That's in Isaiah 49, 7, 56, 52, 13 to 15, and 53, 1 to 12. After his suffering, he would be exalted and would see the light. Now that's mentioned in Isaiah 53. It's not in every English translation, including the ESV, which I'm using here but it is mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So it's starting to show up in some English translations since people are realizing that it's actually in the Dead Sea Scrolls that he would see the light. In some translations, it merely says he will see. He would then restore Israel in Isaiah 61, one to three, and will judge the wicked people who rebelled against him and will usher in a new peaceful, comforting Jerusalem in Isaiah 66. Now, where is this new Jerusalem? Well, we also see it in Revelation, new Jerusalem, heaven. There's a claim, again, that a servant is Israel or a remnant of Israel. Some people have argued that the passage is about either Israel as a country or Israel as a group of people, yet there are several reasons to discredit this assertion. Isaiah said his appearance was marred beyond human semblance, so it's not really Israel as a country. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us. He shall bear their iniquities. He makes intercession for the transgressors. It wasn't that he himself was a transgressor. And in other passages, in many passages, it says that Israel, unfortunately, was an exile for good reason. It was an exile because of what it had done. It had done to itself. And so it says, in, unlike that, it says, he was righteous and had done no violence and no deceit was in his mouth. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. Of course, you remember that Joseph of Arimathea, the rich man, buried Jesus or helped to bury Jesus in his own tomb. Uh, he was pierced for our transgressions. So God wouldn't punish Israel for the tr transgressions of Babylonia or Assyria. That just would not be a just thing for him to do. He's not going to pu punish one group of mere humans for the sins of another group of mere humans. Okay, so uh, in the Old Testament, Israel was constantly punished with exile for its own iniquities. So it was not righteous, and it, it can't say that it had done no violence. Of course, Israel had done violence many times. So if you look at that, and I won't get into this too much, what you can see here if you see it on the screen, but things like we've got different uh, references. The Lord laid on him, him being the third person singular and an objective, laid on him the iniquity of us, first person plural, and again, objective. He, the third person singular, subjective, shall bear their third person plural, and possessive iniquities. He, in the third person singular subjective, makes intercession for the transgressors, which is plural. Okay, so again, it's one group, uh, one person taking on the sins of all of these other people, the transgressors. But the person who takes on the sins can't take them on if he has sin himself. So he is completely righteous without sin, and that's why Jesus was uniquely qualified to take on the sins of the world. Some say Isaiah 53 is in the past tense, so the event had to be before Isaiah, all right? So it was something Isaiah was writing about. But Isaiah is considered a prophet because he foretold the future. 
So that was something to note. Uh, the original he Hebrew is actually in the perfect tense, which, and I'll quote this from Google, describes completed actions in the past, present, and future. Okay, so English translations might put it in the past, they might put it in the future, just depends on how the scholars think it would fit best. But it actually is in the perfect tense, so it's actually written about the future. Isaiah was written at a time when the Hebrews were in exile under the Assyrians, which was foretold in Deuteronomy 28, 15 to 68, as a curse for its disobedience. If it is a remnant which completely innocent person or people were pierced for our transgressions prior to Isaiah. So who's going to be pierced for our transgressions? Who, who, did, who did that? Well, the only one that we know was on the cross, hands and feet pierced for our transgressions. Now, let's take a look at what the Jews were thinking about Isaiah 53. In the Targum, and this is written around 300 AD, uh, Isaiah 53, which has been attributed to Jonathan ben Uziel of the first century, with the Talmud assigning some portions to Joseph ben Chiaja around 300 AD. It includes the following interpretation of Isaiah 53.10. And it was the Lord's good pleasure to refine and purify the remnant of his people in order to cleanse their soul from sin. They shall look upon the kingdom of their Messiah, they shall multiply sons and daughters, and that they perform the law of the Lord shall prosper in his good pleasure. Okay, so he's saying it's purify the people, cleanse their soul from sins, because the Messiah is the one who redeemed them. Okay, so he realized, this person who wrote this realized that there was a Messiah in this passage in Isaiah 53. The Sanhedrin were really interesting about prophecies, and I've referenced parts of this Sanhedrin 98a before, but I'm going to reference a little bit more this time because I think this is fascinating stuff. So, wait, did I skip some? I didn't skip some. Okay, so Rabbi Alexandri says, Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi raises a contradiction between two depictions of the coming of the Messiah. It is written, there came with the clouds of heaven, one like unto a son of man, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. And that's in Daniel 7, 13 to 14. And it is written, behold, your king will come to you. He is just and victorious, lowly and riding upon a donkey and upon a colt, the fowl of a donkey. That's in Zechariah 9.9. Rabbi Alexandria explains, if the Jewish people merit redemption, the Messiah will come in a miraculous manner with the clouds of heaven. If they do not merit redemption, the Messiah will come lowly and riding upon a donkey. And of course, Jesus did. He came into Jerusalem during the Passion Week, lowly and riding on a donkey, and they proclaimed him our Savior. Also, they referenced Isaiah 59, 20, the Sanhedrin again. They said, when distress will come like a river that the breath of the Lord drives. That's in Isaiah 59, 19. And it's juxtaposed with the verse, and a redeemer will come to Zion. And that's in Isaiah 59, 20. And another reference, and Rabbi Yohanan says, the son of David will come only in a generation that is entirely innocent, in which case they will be deserving of redemption, or in a generation that is entirely guilty, in which case there will be no alternative to redemption. He may come in a generation that is entirely innocent, as is written, and your people also shall be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever, Isaiah 60, 21. He may come in a generation that is entirely guilty, as it is written. And he saw that there was no man and was astonished that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation to him and his righteousness. It sustained him. And that's in Isaiah 59, 16. And it is written, for my own sake, for my own sake, will I do it. For how shall it be profaned? And my glory, I will not give it to another. Isaiah 48, 11. And then the Sanhedrin also says, Rabbi Alexandria explains, if they merit redemption through repentance and good deeds, I will hasten the coming of the Messiah. If they do not merit redemption, the coming of the Messiah will be in its designated time. So the coming of the Messiah was in its designated time about 2,000 years ago. So Isaiah prophesied uh, exiles. Here's what Isaiah prophesied, and this is what makes people come up with theories like Deutero Isaiah theory. Prophesied around uh, the, the Babylon, Babylonian destruction of Assyria, which occurred starting around 609 BC. Uh, in Isaiah 14, 24 to 25, 31, 8 to 9, 37, uh, 36 to 38. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord, and some of your own sons who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. 
Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord that you have spoken is good, for he thought there will be peace and security in my day, <laughs> selfishly. But anyway, so yes, you remember the kingdoms and how it progressed. So uh, the Babylonians destroyed the Assyrians, and that kingdom was around for a while. The, there was Babylonian destruction of the first temple in 586, and Isaiah, he knew about that. Guess what? He's a major prophet. He said in Isaiah 63, 18 to 19, your holy cities have become a wilderness. Zion has become a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation. Our holy and beautiful house where our fathers praised you has been burned by fire and all our pleasant places have become ruins. That's in Isaiah 64. The Isaiah also prophesied the exiles and kingdoms. So he prophesied the Mede and the Persian rise to power, which occurred again in 539. In Isaiah 13, 17 to 19, 40, 20 to 23, 47, 11, and 29 to 10. Here's what he says in 45, 1 to 5. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other beside me. There is no God. He also prophesied the Jewish return from exile and the rebuilding of the temple, which began around 539 and ended in 516. So the temple was rebuilt by 516 BC. He says in Isaiah 53, or I'm sorry, 45, 13, I have stirred him up in righteousness and I will make all his ways level. He shall build my city and set my exiles free, not for price or reward, says the Lord of hosts. Okay, so he prophesied that. Jesus also preempted the claims that Isaiah was not a prophet by saying that he was a prophet. And in fact, he mentioned in the book of Acts, it's mentioned about uh, the, it, it's also mentioned about this passage that refers to Isaiah 53. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was over reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join his, this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited to Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shear is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does this prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And again, you can go and find all this in Acts 8, 26-38. And we also have reference from John 12, 36 to 43, a reference that you can compare with Isaiah 6 and 53. When Jesus said these things, he departed and him hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. Think of people like Nicodemus and Joseph Arimathea, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Jesus also said, for this is he who has spoken by the prophet Isaiah when he said the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the Lord makes his path straight. That's in Matthew 3, 3. And it's referencing, of course, John the Baptist. Paul in Romans 10, 16 said, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? And then we also have references to the other three gospels, uh, 
you, you can find again of the prophet Isaiah, first and second Corinthians, Galatians, first Peter, Hebrews, Ephesians, and Revelation. So pretty important stuff. We also have references um, from the OT to second Kings eight or 28 to 11 and second Chronicles 32, 20 to 23. And so I've mentioned some of these other quotes before and also Ben Sirach referring to Isaiah and also talking about the Holy One. Okay, so the Holy One. And we also had a Cyrus in Josephus' book, Antiquities of the Jews. It says, this was known to Cyrus by his reading the book, which Isaiah left behind him of his prophecies. For this prophet said that God had spoken thus to him in a secret vision. My will is that Cyrus, whom I have appointed to be king over many and great nations, send back my people to their own land and build my temple. Okay, so of course, Josephus, who was an early uh, Jew, who was, a, who was an historian, and he was writing in the first century AD. Okay, so he was born somewhere around 37 AD. And he also referenced it in the book against Appian. So he also referenced the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah was believed to be a very important prophet. So here's how we're going to end on this. We're going to talk about just the final geographic inclusions, which sort of blend the whole book of Isaiah and also help to refute this Deutero-Isaiah hypothesis. So in the geographic inclusions, we have multiple mentions to uh, references to Zion, Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. There are references to Babylon as there rather than here, like in Isaiah 52, 11, implying that the person who's writing this is in uh, Jerusalem, basically, not in Babylon. So we've got that in Jerusalem as a place where people will come rather than go. So again, Isaiah positioning himself in Jerusalem. We have specific types of trees that were local to places like Jerusalem, like the cedar, palm, acacia, myrtle, pine, plain, cypress, and olive, and valleys and plains Achor and Sharon around where he resided in Judah. He mentions only three uh, of the four plants used in Sukkot, which maybe because the citron had not yet been imported from Northern India. He makes many mentions of mountains and hills, which is consistent with a person who's in Judah and not Babylon, which was a flat land. He mentions the presence of places that are either rarely named or not named in later books of the Old Testament. And there's an absence of places that surrounded Babylon in the eighth to sixth centuries BC. So we've got a lot of unity in the book of Isaiah. And so you can just see some ancient maps here. So that is where we're going to conclude today. I hope you like this kind of content. And if you do, just remember, whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Thank you so much.